Every day, we are exposed to plants and other forms of living creatures around the world. And of course, plants have ways of adapting to our environment. All present living creatures are composed of carbon. Utilizing and acquiring carbon is essential to life. Carbon dioxide is an ultimate source of carbon. However, autotrophs are the only ones that can transform carbon in the form of carbon dioxide. Photoautotrophs make use of the sun's energy to convert carbon dioxide into simple organic compounds. This is done through the process of photosynthesis. So basically, it results into oxygen as the released byproduct and fixation of carbon dioxide into simple sugars. So the net effect of this chemical reaction is the use of six molecules of water and the production of six molecules of oxygen for every six molecules of carbon dioxide that are transformed into one molecule of sugar. It is also important to note that the process of photosynthesis occurs in these specialized cells called the mesophyll. Now, in order for the process to completely take its shape, the carbon dioxide enters the leaf through openings or pores on its surface called the stomata. And it is done through the process of diffusion which causes the movement of the carbon dioxide to move from an area of higher concentration to lower concentration. The portion of the electromagnetic spectrum is presented in the picture to only depict that the photosynthetic organisms make use of the wavelengths between the 400 and 700 nanometers. Now going back to our discussion regarding photosynthesis, it actually involves two kinds of processes. The first kind involves the light-dependent phase, which makes use of the presence of sunlight, while the other kind of phase is what we call the light independent phase, which does not directly involve the presence of sunlight. So first of all, the light-dependent phase begins through the photochemical reaction due to the chloroplast absorbing sunlight, which therefore results to raising the energy level of the chlorophyll molecule. Then, the excited molecule becomes unstable, and electrons return to the relaxed state, thus releasing absorbed energy. The acceptor molecule of the absorbed energy undergoes photosynthetic electron transport, therefore producing ATP and NADPH. Now, having mentioned the light-dependent phase, it is now time to dwell on the other kind of process, the light-independent phase, which does not directly involve the presence of sunlight, and it is also important to note that the carbon dioxide is incorporated into simple sugars. Now, the incorporation of the simple sugars occurs when the 5-carbon molecule radulose biphosphate combines with the carbon dioxide to form two molecules of a 3-carbon compound called phosphoglycerate. Now, the plant converts the 3-phosphoglycerate into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which is used to make some simple sugars or starches and other requirements for plant growth. This photosynthetic pathway involving the initial fixation of carbon dioxide into 3-carbon phosphoglycerate is also known as the Calvin-Benson cycle or the C3 cycle. Now, because leaves both use carbon dioxide during the process of photosynthesis, and at the same time they also produce carbon dioxide during the process of cellular respiration, the differences and the rates of these two processes is the net gain of carbon, and which is referred to as the net photosynthesis. It is also important to note that there is another kind of process involving photosynthesis, which takes place when the demand for carbon dioxide are reduced for reasons such as the reduction in light. The stomata tends to close, thus reducing the flow into the leaf. As a result, the carbon dioxide diffuses into the leaf through the stomata, and the water vapor inside the leaf diffuses out through the same openings 
This water loss through the stomata is called transpiration. We all know that all organisms require water in order to survive. This holds true especially for plants. Many people water their ornamental plants, and farmers wait for the rain in order to produce good yields. But how exactly does water get into the plants from the atmosphere, in the case of rain, or from external sources such as the faucet? To begin with, let us define some terms. Water performs work. The measure of energy available to do work is called Gibbs energy. The measure used to describe the Gibbs energy of water along the soil to plant to atmosphere continuum is called water potential. A plant containing great amounts of water has a high water potential. Water exerts an outward force on a plant's cell wall. This force is called turgor pressure. As water is lost through the plant's stomata, turgor pressure decreases, and the plant's water potential also decreases. This decrease is quantified as the pressure potential. At atmospheric pressure, pure water has a water potential of zero, and the addition of solutes further decreases the water potential. The magnitude by which solutes decrease the water potential is quantified as the osmotic potential, and always assumes a negative value. Water also adheres to other surfaces. This adherence reduces the capacity of water to do work, and therefore lowers water potential. This is quantified as the matrix potential. So now that we know the terms, we must know why I discussed those terms in the first place. The total water potential at any point in the plant is the sum of pressure potential, osmotic potential, and matrix potential. Now, let's move on to how water moves into the soil, to the plant, and to the atmosphere through stomata. It is known that water moves from an area of high water potential to an area of low water potential. To do so, the soil must have greater water potential than the plant's roots that absorb the water from the soil. Now these roots must have greater potential than the leaves, which in turn must have higher water potential than the atmosphere to where water is ultimately deposited. Now, as water is sucked up from the soil by the plant's roots, the soil's water potential decreases, which allows it to acquire more water, and the cycle begins again. Another important molecule needed by plants is carbon dioxide. Terrestrial plants can easily acquire carbon dioxide from the air. Aquatic plants have a different mechanism. Carbon dioxide reacts with water to form bicarbonate via a reversible reaction. Carbon dioxide can diffuse easily from the water across the cell membrane. Some plants, however, use the enzyme carbonic anhydrase to convert bicarbonate into carbon dioxide, which they can use for their physiological processes. Weird as it may seem, but plants also have a homeostatic mechanism which allows them to perform a variety of functions given a set of criteria such as an optimum temperature, optimum pressure, optimum altitude, uh, whatever they may be. Now, the reason being is that plants require these criteria in order for them to execute their physiological functions such as photosynthesis and simply existing because we cannot manifest or we cannot see how plants do this we can just see that plants have fruits and they have flowers they have long long tree trunks that extend up into the sky now 
like humans or like animals plants have an optimum temperature wherein they can execute their physiological functions mainly photosynthesis temperatures cannot go way above or way below this optimum temperature now some plants prefer colder temperatures such as the pine trees in Baguio City and some plants prefer the warmer temperature of the tropical area such as Exora, Neonoclea, uh, this uh, weird creature that they call the ant plant uh, and many more, many more plants live in the tropics now plants maintain their temperature in the leaf this is because leaf temperatures are critical for the execution of photosynthesis uh, heat is transferred between the leaf and the external environment through two main processes first of which is convection in a physical perspective, convection is the transfer of heat in a circulating manner through the use of fluids. This occurs mostly in aquatic plants because they have their water around them. Now, terrestrial plants exchange heat through evaporation. This is like when a human sweats plants also need to release water which has high specific heat through a process called transpiration. Terrestrial plants have evolved a range of adaptations in response to variations in precipitation and soil moisture. Therefore, the demand for water is seen to be linked to temperature. For plants, as air temperature rises, saturation and vapor pressure will likewise rise thus increasing gradient of water vapor between the inside of the leaf and the outside air. As a result, the amount of water required by the plant to offset losses from transpiration will likewise increase with temperature. When the atmosphere is dry, plants respond by partially closing the stomata and opening them for shorter periods of time. In the early period of water stress, a plant closes its stomata during the hottest parts of the day when relative humidity is low. Closing the stomata reduces water loss from transpiration but also reduces carbon dioxide diffusion into the leaf and heat dissipation through evaporative cooling. Plants can therefore be differentiated based on how they minimize water loss. The first type of plants are called C3 plants. In C3 plants, the capture of light energy and transformation of carbon dioxide into sugars occur in the mesophyll cells. Products of photosynthesis move into the vascular bundles where they are transported to other parts of the plant. Around 95% of the plants on earth are C3 plants. Example C3 plants are beans, rice, wheat, and potatoes. The next type of plant is called C4 plants. In contrast to the C3 plants, the C4 plants have two distinct photosynthetic cells, the mesophyll cells and the bundle sheet cells. The bundle sheet cells surround the veins or vascular bundles. C4 plants divide their photosynthesis between the mesophyll cells and the bundle sheet cells. C4 plants live in hot, moist, or arid and saline habitats and are considered to be more efficient in photosynthesis compared to C3 plants. Corns and sugar canes are considered C4 plants. Both C3 and C4 plants have their stomata open during the daytime, but the last type of plant called CAM plants have their stomata open at nighttime. This type of plant is found mostly in desert areas. An example of a CAM plant is the cactus. Our cactus over here knows how to prevent water loss. And instead of separating the light-dependent reactions and the use of CO2 in the Calvin cycle in space, they separated the processes in time. At night, CAM plants open their stomata, allowing CO2 to diffuse into the leaves. The carbon dioxide is converted to an organic acid. The acid is then stored inside vacuums until the next day. In the daytime, the cactus closes its stomata but it can still photosynthesize. This is because the organic acids are transferred out of the vacuoles and are broken down to release CO2, which then enters the Calvin cycle. Other than plants adapting to water demand, they can also respond to environmental changes. It was observed that when two plants belong to the same species are grown in different thermal conditions, divergence in the temperature response of photosynthesis was observed. 
In general, individuals grown under cooler temperatures exhibit a lowering of its optimal temperature for photosynthesis. These modifications in temperature response of net photosynthesis are results of the process of reversible phenotypic change in response to changing environmental conditions. This is termed acclimation. Plants also exhibit adaptations to variations in nutrient availability. Availability of nutrients has many direct effects on plant survival, growth, and reproduction. Elements such as organic matter, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, sulfur, and potassium are known as macronutrients and are needed by the plants in large amounts. On the other hand, trace elements or micronutrients such as chlorine, iron, manganese, boron, copper, and many more are required only in small amounts by the plant. If micronutrients are lacking, plants fail as completely as if they lack macronutrients. The best example of direct link between nutrient availability and plant performance involves nitrogen. Nitrogen plays an important role in photosynthesis. Maximum rate of photosynthesis for a species is correlated with the nitrogen content of its leaves. Climate, geology, and biological activities alter nutrient availability in the soil. Some environments are relatively rich in nutrients and others are poor. How do plants from low nutrient environments succeed? Because plants require nutrients for synthesizing new tissue, a plant's growth rate influences its demand for nutrients. In turn, the plant's nutrient uptake rate also influences its growth. The important point here is that not all plants have the same maximum potential rate of growth. Plants often reduce their rate of photosynthesis in low nutrient environments. However, species that naturally grow in high nutrient environments keeps increasing its growth rate. Furthermore, species native to low nitrogen environment has its maximum rate of growth at low to medium nitrogen availability. Some plant ecologists suggest that low maximum growth rate is an adaptation to low nutrient environment. One advantage of slower growth is that plants can avoid stress under low nutrient conditions. Slow growing plants can still maintain optimal rates of photosynthesis and other metabolic processes crucial for growth under low nutrient availability. In contrast, a plant with inherent high rate of growth will show signs of stress. As a result, plants inhabiting low nutrient environments tend to have higher leaf longevity. A good example is the dominance of pine species on nutrient-poor sandy soils in coastal regions.